pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, causing trouble, and by this many become defiled. Hebrews 12, 14. I'm Darlene. And I'm Melody. This is Hard Times and True Crimes. Well, I just wanted to give a shout out to our number one fan, Buddy Mabe. Thank y'all for buying us coffee this week. We sure do appreciate y'all. And we love the comments we get from you. Yes. Always so encouraging. Yes. Thank you for engaging on Facebook. So that is always encouraging. Yep. <laughs> okay. So you have anything you want to share this week, Melody? Well, I did want to mention, I don't know if you've seen all of the talk over on Facebook about the ghost of Naomi Wise. Uh, no, I have <laughs> not heard that. So the episode, remember you did the episode about Naomi mm-hmm. Wise. That's a very common tale around here. Oh, yeah. Uh, that took place over in Randleman area. And so the last week or two, I've seen a lot of talk, but there's this one post that keeps going around. There's this man saying he had gone down to the Deep River Trail to a, take a walk. And while he was down there, he saw this lady in the river with like this oh. straight gray hair. And she was just looking at him and he started getting really cold. I mean, the, the story goes on <laughs> the and typical on. typical ghost story. <laughs> yes. It just goes on and on. And he's talking about how he saw some other people and they saw it too. Hmm. And so it's created quite a little firestorm recently. And I've just seen several of my friends sharing it or talking about it or posting about it. So I thought uh, that should give you a resurgence of popularity on your Naomi Wise episode. Yes. Do you remember what episode that was? Yeah, that would have been episode 27, Poor Naomi Wise. And that was a really good episode, too. So, yeah, if you've heard the talk, if you're local and you've heard the talk about the ghost sightings of (laughs) Naomi Wise at Random and Deep River Trail, go listen to that episode and hear the details. All the true details. I don't know that she would have gray hair because she was really young when she died. Exactly. But, you know, hey, (laughs) maybe it was another old lady in the river. (laughs) So today we're telling a crazy story about some serious family drama. This will make you appreciate your family. Exactly. (laughs) Even if you have drama, you probably don't have drama like this. Exactly. And this is actually the first part of a two-part series. We're telling this one together. We are. And Darlene and I recently took a road trip to the area where a lot of this took place. Yes. And we'll fill you in on those details as we tell the story. Because these murders, there are lots of them. And, and they span yeah, several- all the way from Louisville, Kentucky to mm-hmm. Greensboro, North Carolina. And yeah. Winston? And Winston-Salem. Okay, so it's fa- a fairly local case. Mm-hmm. Our main source for this is a book called Bitter Blood, written by local author Jerry Bledsoe. Back in 1985, he wrote a series for the news and record about the this whole crazy tale. It was a solid week of installments in August of 1985. And then later ended up writing, using those and writing the book and telling the story in more detail. It is truly wild. It is. He did a great job. He did a great job. So that's mainly where we got most of our mm-hmm. information. And so um, we thank him for his excellent research and writing on that. Absolutely. And the rest of our sources, along with that, we'll have listed on our show notes. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to start with Dolores and Chuck Lynch, who had moved into the house in Prospect, Kentucky, on Covered Bridge Road in 1970, when Dolores was 54 years old. She had been moving around from place to place her whole marriage because of her husband Chuck's job. She'd always really resented having to move so much. She hated it. You know, she would feel like she got settled. It would be time to move again. And Dolores swore this was it. She was not moving again. (laughs) She was done with the moves. So by 1984, she'd been in the big house 14 years, longer than she'd ever lived anywhere in her entire life. Chuck had passed away watching a football game the year before in 1983. Their two children, Tom and Janie, were grown up. Tom by that time, had moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he had set up a successful dental practice. 
And Janie had just temporarily moved back in with Dolores that summer after graduating from dental school. Dolores craved routine. That was her personality. She liked circumstances that she could control. (laughs) I can relate to that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And now that she'd been settled in this house, you know, in this town for so many years, her routines and rituals, you know, they were set like stone. Every Sunday morning was the same. Dolores would meet her good friend Marjorie in the parking lot at Grace Episcopal Church in Louisville. And and that was 17 miles from her house. She would drive there, park beside her friend Marjorie. They walked in together. After the service, she and Dolores would meet their other friends in the foyer. And they'd have a cup of coffee and talk. Afterwards, the two of them would walk back out to their vehicles while they chit-chatted. Until Dolores inevitably would tell Marjorie she had to go because her daughter Janie was going to be waiting on her at home with their donuts, <laughs> which was also a ritual. Every Sunday, while Dolores was at church, Janie drove to the local store and bought the two of them each a yeast donut. This was just their Sunday ritual to have donuts and coffee together. She'd have that ready when Dolores got home. But around 10 a.m. that Sunday, July 22nd, 1984, when Dolores told Marjorie she had to go because Janie and the donuts, they told each other bye. And about 1030, Dolores pulled into the Prospect Chevron gas station, which was just up the road from her house. She wanted to get her red can filled up with gas because she was going to mow the yard that day. And she wanted to get her car filled up. A boy named Butch, he filled her up and Dolores went in and talked to the guys. You know, she lived right down the road, so she was familiar with them and just went in and joked around with them. They all liked her, even though they knew her and you did not want to make her mad. (laughs) You know, sometimes she had to tell them off, but (laughs) for the most part, they really liked her. Butch was finished filling up her car. She uh, got back in the car and headed home. She stopped at the bottom of her driveway to pick up the Sunday paper, and she had a long driveway. Then she'd followed it past the wooden bridge and then, you know, up the hill to her house. As she pulled up, she got out of her car. She was carrying her purse, her Bible, uh, the Sunday paper, her gas receipt, a sweater that she'd carried with her to church that morning, and she had her keys. And someone had been waiting, crouched down either behind Janie's car or behind Chuck's old car in the driveway. Hmm. And just as she was about to open the garage door, she was shot in the back by a military assault rifle. Oh, wow. And then as she was falling, another shot rang out. And this time she was shot in the head. Hmm. Janie inside waiting for her mom well, to come home ask, from was church. Was she there yet? She was, and she'd either been in the backyard or in, you know, just inside when she heard the shots. And so, of course, she came out to figure out what in the world was going on. And the killer saw her, and she must have saw them as well because she ran, and they came after her. Janie was shot in the back just before she could get to the kitchen door. But still, she managed to get inside the kitchen and tried to get to the phone, but she knew they were coming. She could hear them. And she just didn't have time. Hmm. So she ran into a closet where she had intended to set off a panic alarm they had. But again, she had to run. She heard yeah. them coming. And so she anyway got out of the closet before she was able to, to hit that alarm. Oh. Um, so she ran into her mother's bedroom through a set of French doors into the sunroom where she had nowhere else to run. She crouched down on the floor. And all the killer had to do was to follow the trail of blood. Mm -hmm, Because she had already been shot. Right. Wow. I'm sorry. That just had to be so scary. Can you imagine the terror you would feel? No, I can't. And Janie and her mom already had this major fear of, of being robbed. In fact, they had both taken karate lessons and they had guns. I mean, they were, it was an actual fear of them, of theirs, because they lived so far out and they were wealthy. Yeah. And I guess that's why they had the panic button. Yes. Because I mean, it's not every house that has that. Exactly. But inevitably, the killer came into Dolores' room to the French doors 
and they shot Janie execution style um, in her head. Mm, that's so sad. It is. And how old was she? She was actually 39. She okay. didn't look 39. She was young. She looked very young and beautiful. But yeah, she was 39. So when Susan, a friend of Dolores's, couldn't get her on the phone that Sunday afternoon, she wondered what was going on. Because this is this is how worried about robbers Dolores was. I guess she was convinced that if she was going to be robbed, they would call her house first. Because <laughs> Dolores, she was very predictable. And she always left her phone off the hook if she was going to be gone. Because she thought if someone intended to rob her, if they called first, they'd think she was home. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes. That, honestly, that sounds like something I would do. <laughs> but also Dolores did that because the phone ringing made her dogs go insane. You know, she just didn't want to aggravate her dog. They were like kids to her. So anyway, it was just weird that the phone was ringing because that wasn't like Dolores to let it ring like that. Yeah. So she, tr Susan tried calling a few more times that Sunday night and didn't get an answer and then the next day, she figured she'd just wait for Dolores to call her, but she didn't, of course. And so when Susan tried calling her again, the phone rang and rang. And then she was kind of convinced something must be wrong with her. So she decided if she had not heard from Dolores by that Tuesday morning, the next morning, she was going over there. She didn't. And Susan worked at a real estate office that was less than five miles from Dolores's house. So when she got off work at 1.30 that afternoon, she drove over to Dolores' house. She pulled up the driveway and, as she, you know, she there was that hill past the bridge. And as she was coming up it, she saw Dolores' Oldsmobile, Chuck's Volkswagen, and Janie's Nova. But when she reached the top of the hill, she saw Dolores' body laying in front of the garage door. Mm. And she was panic stricken sure but I, I would be thinking i need to get out of here yes and so not only was she just you know i'm sure just so you know everything she was feeling for her friend she was probably scared to death and I, couldn't get out of there fast I enough would have so dan davidson of the kentucky state police and detective lynn nobles of oldham county they headed up the investigation a few things they figured out pretty quick like the times of their death and the bullets that were used were .223 shells, which they knew had come from those high-powered assault, oh, okay. you know, rifles. Investigators told the media they believed that the murders had been committed during a robbery. And they were open to that possibility, but they actually did not really believe that. And is that because those high-powered rifles? Mm -hmm. Because who really robs a house using that? Yeah, and not only that, but the evidence just wasn't really pointing in that direction. Okay. Uh, I mean, Janie's... Okay, so she had a jewelry box, and it had been rifled through. Her purse had been dumped out. But the only things that they knew were missing was a handgun that belonged to Dolores and a necklace that she had wore with a little turquoise cross on it. Other than that, though, I mean, there were big ticket items left laying all around, like electronics, a $50,000 Persian rug. Wow. And uh, silver just Wait. laid out in plain sight. $50,000? $50, $50, oh, my Persian gracious. Rug. Mm -hmm. A robbery just didn't make the most sense. To look at the situation, it would have made the most sense, actually, because why would somebody want these two ladies dead right. unless it was to come rob them? But this actually looked like a professional hit. But who and why? Okay, so I'm going to go back and tell their story. Dolores Lynch was born May 30th in 1916 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Her father, John Rogers, passed away in 1932, just as the Great Depression was kind of starting. Dolores was 15 years old, and her brother... Elmer became the man of the house at just 18. And those were some hard years for everybody. Work and money were scarce. And the family had to move around from place to place to place. And I think that started her. She hated not being in control of her circumstances. And I would imagine that's, I guess that's where her hate yes. of being able to having to move because mm -hmm. it disrupts your stability. Right. And she was probably craving some stability. And I think before that, when her dad was alive, she did have stability. 
And so I think that just marked some terrible years for her. And she probably just had that personality that she needed control. She needed stability, which I totally understand. But anyway, Elmer, he did take his responsibility to heart. And not only did he make sure his mother and sister always had a roof over their head and something to eat, he also saw to it that Dolores was able to finish high school. Just before the end of the Depression, Elmer was hired on as a seal test milk routeman. And he would end up staying there until until he retired. And I don't think he ever married either. But because of the stability that that job afforded him, He was able to help Dolores accomplish her dream of becoming a nurse. Oh, that's great. Yeah, which was big back then. So according to the book, Bitter Blood, written by Jerry Bledsoe that we talked about, Dolores, even decades later, would tell everybody she knew that nobody ever lived poorer than she did and that she knew the value of a dollar. And she did. She was telling the truth. So when Dolores started working as a nurse at Pittsburgh, Uh, Pittsburgh's Mercy Hospital, a friend had set her up on a blind date with Charles Lynch Jr. And his nickname was Chuck. Chuck was only five foot three, but he was really good at sports. In high school, he was a starting guard on the Vandergriff high basketball team. And he was a bantamweight golden glove boxer. Oh, wow. I know. And as good as he was at sports, he was even better in academics. Chuck had won an academic scholarship and became a business major at the University of Pittsburgh. After he graduated, he was hired on as an accountant at the General Electric plant in Pittsburgh. But then World War II started and his country needed him and he was falling in love with Dolores. So Chuck joined the Navy and proposed to Dolores. And she accepted, and they were married on January 11th in 1942. During the war, Chuck rose to the rank of chief petty officer, which was pretty, I mean, that's a, that's a short while to be able to raise, you know, okay. to, to go that high in rank. While Dolores, she set up house near the port that he was stationed at in New Jersey, and she worked as a nurse until their first child, a daughter, that they named Jane Alda. She was born on October 28th in 1944. When the war ended, Chuck went back to his old job at General Electric. And then their son, Thomas, John, and his nickname was Tom, where he was born on August 16th in 1947. So Chuck, he was just as ambitious at his job as he had been in school and as he had been in the military. He took advantage of all the company's business training courses and quickly moved up in the company. He was like, I mean, he was a really promising employee, like an upcoming executive. His first big position was a traveling auditor. The only drawback was that he had to travel and spent months at a time away from home. And Dolores hated being left at home alone with the kids. Yeah, and that wouldn't be ideal when you have small kids. I mean, right. you know, I can I can see that. Yeah, and it really caused her to grow bitter towards mm. Chuck. And the colder she became, the more he worked. Or the more he worked, the colder she became. I don't know which came it's first. that cycle, isn't it? It is. But there was no doubt that Chuck, he definitely probably was a workaholic. Um, you know, whether he was drove to that, I don't know, but... After a promotion allowed him to stop traveling, though, his other positions through the years had him constantly moving his family around once they moved four times in three years. But Chuck really didn't see the problem with it. I mean, he was grateful for the opportunities that he'd been given and felt like having to move from time to time was a small price to pay for the lifestyle that, you know, they were afforded. Chuck and Dolores belonged to a prestigious country club. He was able to take up golfing. Dolores belonged to the theater association. Janie and Tom went to private schools. You know, the family, they lived in these charming houses with nice lawns in the best neighborhood. And so, I don't know. He just felt like, what's there to complain about? Yeah. And he has reached his goals. He's right. arrived. He's enjoying it. But I, I, and then on her side, I guess it's like, yeah, but we're having to start over every time we turn around. Right. And I think he's thinking I'm providing for y'all. You know, yeah. men, I think at their core, that's, that's really important to them. Right. And women, you know, they have other needs 
I, I think that was probably their disconnect. Right. Because women do have more of those relational needs. But exactly. Yeah, you can't work all the time and be relational too. Right. Right. They moved for the last time to Louisville, Kentucky, when Tom was away at college in North Carolina in 1970. By this time and long before it, Dolores was miserable in her marriage. Whatever love she once had for Chuck had turned into pure hatred. Oh, no. I mean, pure hatred. She was mean. However respected and admired he was at work, it was not that way at home. Dolores ran the show and... And for some reason, he did not stand up to her. Oh, wow. Which was really not his personality in any other area of his life. So that's interesting. Yeah, it is. But I hate to see that because when you were telling the earlier part of the story, yeah. how they fell in love and it and sounds like this did. sweet love story. And now to see it end so sad. Yeah. And did, I think they did really love each other. I was going to say, did they stay married? But you said that, that she mm -hmm. was a widow. So they had stayed married. Okay. Yeah. Dolores ran him down every chance she got to friends, to family. She even humiliated him in front of his colleagues. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. And he just, the more he, she did that, the more he just focused on work. And she just focused on keeping an immaculate house. And she focused on the kids. In fact, probably too much on the kids. She was kind of meddling in their life, you know, especially her daughter, Janie. She was kind of weirdly close to her. She was like a coddling helicopter mom, you know, mm -hmm. and sadly, she actually even poisoned Janie against her own dad. Oh, for a minute there, I thought you were going to say, I thought you were saying she poisoned Janie. No. Okay, okay. Okay. No, no, no. But you know how it is when you're constantly. Yeah. You're putting them she down. constantly put them down. Oh, yeah. that's sad. And she tried the same things with her son, Tom, but things were different with him. He loved his mom and he respected her, but he loved his dad too. And, you know, Dolores would sometimes push her boundaries with Tom, but she knew when to back off with him. Tom, though, he met and fell for a girl when he was in college at Wake Forest. Her name was Susie Newsom. She was from a prominent North Carolina family and was two years older than him. And he was just actually really kind of flattered that she was even interested in him at all because he thought she was absolutely beautiful. But I'm gonna tell you what, Dolores was not impressed with her at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dolores likes to be in charge already, you've said. So she probably doesn't want any woman coming and taking her son away. Right. And she thought Susie was an absolute snob. And she really wasn't wrong, to be honest. Well, I'm gonna Sometimes tell you moms, a little bit moms about have intuition. <laughs> right. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Susie, but snob is a great way to put it. Um, yes. According to some. Yes. Yes. And so according to Dolores, apparently. Right. She was a snob. And I'm sure y'all can guess how that turned out. Tom married her. <laughs> <laughs> and his his mom actually tried really hard talking him into, to talk him into reconsidering. She told him, you know, you don't have to do this. But the feeling was mutual because Susie could not stand Dolores either. And the two ended up actually getting into a big argument on their wedding day. Think of all the red flags going on there. Yes. Yes. Like you can already tell things are not going to go well here. Right. We'll be back after a quick break. Ladies, I don't know about you, but over the last few years, Melly and I have noticed differences in our skin that have been pretty discouraging. You know, the inevitable signs of aging, fine lines, some wrinkles here and there, dull, dry skin and sunspots. Thankfully, there's a non-invasive treatment available without having to go under the knife. Tasha Bryles at Lakeside Integrative in High Point, North Carolina, offers a total skin package that includes radio frequency microneedling and laser skin resurfacing that can be done right in her office in under an hour. It stimulates collagen growth and elastin that improves the surface and texture of your skin, as well as tightening it. The laser treats acne scars, minimizes large pores, and lessens, if not completely fades, sunspots. Melody and I were blessed to get this treatment in late fall. We're going back for our after photos within a couple of weeks, and we'll be sure to post them on our Facebook group. Melody was just saying how she felt like it gave her a fresh start for her skin routine. It even cleared up some precancerous skin lesions she had, and it faded my sunspots completely as well as brightened and tightened my skin. We're really thrilled with our results. 
Lakeside Integrative offers an array of other services for men and women, as well as fillers, laser hair removal, weight loss, hormone, and medical treatments. Don't walk, run to the phone and call Lakeside Integrative to set up your appointment at 336-715-0007. Tell them Darlene and Melody from Hard Times and True Crime sent you. And again, I think Tom married a woman with a personality not unlike his mother, actually. (laughs) He did his best to be a peacemaker between the two, but ultimately he tried to do what he thought was best and stand by his wife. After they were married, Tom was accepted into a dental school in Lexington, Kentucky, only 85 miles from Dolores, but they only saw her once in four years. And how close did they live? 85 miles. Oh, easy drive. Oh, yeah. But once in four years, Susie wasn't having it. Susie hated Dolores. Oh, my goodness. Yes. So when Susie and Tom had their first child, a son that they named John in 1974, Dolores was ecstatic. And she was really ready to let bygones be bygones. She wanted, I think she probably had learned her lesson like, they had established these boundaries with her. He wanted to be a part of her grandson's life. People make mistakes. And I think she wanted to get back in. Well, she, she wanted to be a part of her son's exactly. life. Exactly. She Once she realized she was going to lose that relationship with him and not be able to see those grandkids, that changed the game a little bit. It did. And, and it does. And sometimes you have to teach people boundaries. Mm-hmm. And so I think she was probably like, okay, you know, yes. I, I get it. Um. Well, by this time, Tom had joined the Navy Reserves, and he and Susie were living over in Beaufort, South Carolina. Beaufort or Beaufort? It's Beaufort. (laughs) Yeah, Beaufort, North Carolina. (laughs) I always want to ask that question. (laughs) As soon as she got word, Dolores drove, you know, all the way there, like overnight. She could not wait to see that baby. Gifts in tow. But when she got there, Susie would not even let her in the apartment. Oh, my gosh. She told her to get a room and she could call the next day and make an appointment. Oh, my goodness. And that's the grandmother. That's the grandmother. And the visit was short and awkward. And she it was obvious that she was not wanted. And Susie did not at all try to make her feel welcome. And she did not hide her disdain for her mother-in-law. Okay. You got to feel a little bit bad. I do. Dolores was hurt. I mean, when she went back home, she didn't know what to do. Mm. And then two years later, when baby Jim was born, Dolores wasn't able to see him until he was over a year old. And then just a couple of months later, Tom and his family moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he set up his own dental practice. And you can imagine if they only saw her once in four years, living 85 miles away, how often, you know, were they going to see each other with them living all the way in New Mexico? Now, are these her only grandchildren or does Janie have any kids? No, they're her only. Janie hadn't married. So these were her only grandchildren. Okay. And just so our listeners know, so when we're collaborating on this and we assign each other parts. Yes. So I'm asking these questions because I haven't researched. My part. Yeah. Your part. And vice versa. Except where it overlaps mine. So some of it I know, but a lot of these things I'm just hearing for the first time. Right. That's interesting. They're genuine questions. We're not just being weird. (laughs) Right. Right. Okay. So Chuck retired at 62 years old. So he was at home with Dolores. And she was infuriated, infuriated. So her kids were gone. They're out of the house. And she's telling everybody he did this just to cramp my style. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. I got to laugh because I'm getting ready to go through that whole transition. My husband's going to be retiring in just a few months. And so as much as I'm looking forward to it, it is going to change up the flow of our days. Because I homeschool. He and I have had a lot of discussions and laughs over like, okay, (laughs) You're going to have to find something to do so that we're not driving each other crazy. Right, right. Yeah. So, Tim, don't be cramping my style. Don't be cramping her style, Tim. (laughs) (laughs) She would not even allow him in his own house to come upstairs. Oh, my god! They live completely separate lives. So, yeah, he was downstairs with his, you know, he smoked and drank. And so she hated smoking, like despised smoking, although she used to smoke. For years and years and years. But since she quit, I mean, they said she would like go into restaurants and like tell people off (laughs) and she would go off on him and she just like her housekeeper smoked and she would, you know, just you need to go outside. And it was just funny because it wasn't that long ago that she was like a horrible smoker. Oh, wow. 
He just disgusted her with his cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> so she stayed upstairs with her dogs. Now, the only thing that she did for Chuck was she did cook him supper. But even then, she would buy cheap store brand stuff for his food and would buy steaks for her dogs. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's diabolical. It is. She told everybody that he was just a drunk. And he did drink, but, you know, he had worked for all these years and it had never interfered with his job. But now that he was retired, he was sinking into a depression, as you can imagine. I bet. So his daughter really doesn't have that much to do with him because of her mother. I and mean, you see the way his wife is treating him. She would actually tell people that she wished he would die. Oh, my gosh. And this one lady one time was like, you don't mean that. And she was like, yes, I do. Gracious yes, Dolores. it was terrible. So he was having to be there with her constant negativity. So, yeah, he started drinking more. It was sad. Once he was actually hospitalized and Dolores nor Janie even went to visit him in the hospital. They wouldn't even take him to the hospital. And he then, had to get the he had to call the housekeeper to come and pick him up and take her take him to the hospital. That poor man. It was. It's really actually made me want to cry. Like he when has, I was researching yes, this. Like he has provided so well for her. Does she yes. not realize? Like, oh my gracious, it's that's just me. Actually, heartbreaking. It's so sad. And well, guys, the, hatred is ugly. Forgive people. Yeah, bitterness built. That root of bitterness can turn so ugly. Oh, it's ugly. Yes. So four years after he retired, when he was sixty-six years old in nineteen eighty-three. Chuck had a heart attack and died while he was watching Notre Dame play uh, Pittsburgh. Mm. Yeah, downstairs. And she came downstairs and found found him dead. And she went upstairs and called her friend and was like, I think he's dead. Like she was not even. No. Like she had no sorrow no. or grief over that. That no. is horrible. Um, and I hope, I really hope that some of this is for the sake of the story. And she was not this mean. But everything I've read that's well that's the consensus that, that she was just evil toward him uh, it's unfortunate the way that she died but at the same time you almost think well, I, I thought the same thing yeah like i don't know it's horrible chuck though bless his heart she did not even know in fact when she when he died she told her friends i don't know if i'm a pauper or a, a princess like she had no idea because he had kept her he had given her an allowance like okay. all these years. So she really didn't know how like, much money they had. But Chuck had left Dolores with $2.5 million. Which makes it even worse that she was yes. so horrible to him. And, and he had, left her so well. And had set up tr uh, trust for both of his kids. Wow. So he left her well. He left her very well. So all those years of hard work and wise investments, and he left her the sole beneficiary of everything. And she resented all of that. She and did. was the receiver of. He even took up for her. One time, one of Janie's uh, boyfriends came over and everybody had left and it was just him and uh, Chuck in the house. And Chuck said to him, she really is a good woman. He said, She's just bitter because of all the years that, I mean, he, it was almost like he blamed himself for being away so long and for well, making, it was like it was, that was his punishment. Well, he had probably heard her blame yes. him so much that he just took that blame. Yes. Wow. So sad. I do feel really bad for him. Oh, uh, but anyway, she was going to be taken care of for the rest of her life. And it's, it's really funny because even though she was wealthy and lived among the wealthy, Dolores, who had lived through the Depression, she always shopped secondhand. She clipped coupons. She took advantage of rebates and watched for sales. She did her own yard work. In fact, at 68 years old, she was keeping four acres of land in immaculate condition, like mowing. And it's just crazy. She wasn't about to pay somebody for a job she could do herself. <laughs> right. <laughs> The only thing that she did do was she did have a, a housekeeper. Okay. And she didn't mind in. doing the yard. She just didn't want to do the house. Right. But she was super, super clean with the house too. She just had her come in, I think like once or twice a week to do little things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they said she'd be out in her bibbed overalls, hauling limbs and raking leaves. So just not your typical rich woman. And Dolores, she was actually complicated. There are so many bad things about her. But, you know, like I've said before, people aren't one dimensional. Yeah. So she was this four foot, 11 inch, 100 pounds of 
I don't have you ever heard of the term piss and vinegar? <laughs> no. <laughs> I feel like that term suits her really well. She was just full of like sourness and spunk. <laughs> She was terrible in some ways. She was argumentative with neighbors, loud, opinionated, controlling, (laughs) downright mean as a snake to her husband. But I also admired her in other ways. She acted in plays for the last 10 years of her life, and she was actually really good at it. She volunteered in theaters. And even when she wasn't the one acting, she was always showed up to support the other actors and would hug them and just congratulate them and was truly proud of them. She subbed in college classrooms. She took piano lessons. She was a faithful member of her church, although once she was the driving force of a church split. But <laughs> <laughs> now why am I not over, hymn, over hymnals? <laughs> but anyway, you know, Dolores wasn't for everybody, but she did have friends and To those few, she was a faithful, true friend who um, she was always there when she was needed and sometimes even when she wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) Now, Janie, Janie was a fun, popular, outgoing, beautiful girl, short like her mom. She was just 5'2". She had all the best parts of her mom's personality without the abrasiveness. So she was, she was actually really warm and kind and she wasn't so out, I guess she wasn't so outgoing. Like there was a little bit of, um, not reserve, but mystery behind her. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But she did allow her mother to control her. Her friends noticed it even when she didn't seem to, she took it as like her mother just being really caring. In fact, She had once said her mother was just a Jewish mother, but she wasn't Jewish. (laughs) (laughs) Janie had been engaged five times, but never went through with any of the marriages. Hmm, That's interesting. I think that might have a lot to do with her mom's constant presence in her life. After high school, Janie majored in education at Bradley University. Then she got her master's in special education at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. Then she studied speech pathology in Kentucky. And then finally, she attempted for the first time to get away from her mother. And she actually went to California and she was really happy. She went to Santa Monica Beach where she worked worked as a speech pathologist for children. And then Janie grew restless again, like she always seemed to do. And she started talking about the possibility of going back to school again Her brother, you know, had this successful dental practice and he had told her she could come to work for him if she went through school and wanted to. She just, I don't know, she thought maybe she would like to do that. She'd worked with a lot of dentists and just found it interesting. So Dolores swooped in and convinced her that there was a fine school of dentistry right there in Louisville (laughs) where she would be close to her and they would pay for her school. That's what Janie did. The women in her dorm thought Dolores was so overbearing. She was there all the time. In fact, when Janie was moving in, mind you, she's in her mid thirties at this time. She's uh, Dolores comes in with like curtains and bedding and like stuff for the walls. And she's like completely uh, redecorating everything. She's got like the measuring tape and all that stuff. She actually every single week would drop off Janie's meals and ready to eat containers for every every single meal and can, you know, these Tupperwares. And when the girls would say something, you know, Janie would just kind of laugh it off. She was really devoted to her mom. So it didn't bother her. It didn't seem to bother her. She actually really appreciated and loved her mom, Okay, but she spent a lot of time with her mom. I do know that she would go and watch her mom's plays, which I actually think is really sweet Mm -hmm. because I don't think Dolores had people like that. You know what I mean? She would go out to eat with her mom She just really, I don't know, had a great relationship with her mom. And then four years later, when she graduated dental school in May of 1984, Janie hadn't, but she hadn't been herself. And she had gone to the doctor several times and she was actually diagnosed with anemia and then maybe a thyroid problem. But a lot of people suspected that her real problem was that she was almost 40 years old. She had just finished her third degree she wasn't even, she just wasn't sure what she wanted to do or where she was going. It was like every time she was about to start her life, 
she would go back to school or she would move or, but now she was kind of to the place where she needed to do something. But Dolores told her, Hey, you know, why don't you just move in with me until you figure out what your next move is. And so the Thursday before they were murdered, Janie had just moved the last of her stuff back home. So now I'm going to jump in and I'm going to tell you the family history of Susie Newsom. Mm -hmm. That is Dolores's daughter-in-law. Yes. That she can't stand. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to back up a little bit and tell you about Susie's family. Okay. And uh, you'll, then we'll weave these stories together. All right. Robert Newsom Sr. and Hattie Carter were married in 1919. It was an interfaith marriage. She was a Moravian and he a Presbyterian. And they managed their faith differences by going their separate ways for worship on Sundays. And this seemed to work well for them. Robert began work at RJR Tobacco Company early in the marriage, but he finally decided to branch out and had bought his way into the tobacco warehouse business. They are in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Robert and Hattie had two children, a daughter named Frances and a son named after his father, Robert Newsom Jr. Robert Sr. had purchased a white frame house with a tin roof on six country acres just two miles from the R.J. Reynolds tobacco estate in Winston. And just for historical perspective, if you remember in that episode of the Smith Reynolds shooting, the Newsoms moved to their house just two miles from the Reynolds estate within a year of that event. Really? Would this be Susie's grandfather and grandmother? Mm -hmm. Okay. On her father's side. On her father's side. Okay. Got it. Robert Sr. is Susie's grandfather. Okay. Robert Jr. is her father. Got it. Okay. The house had grand white columns and a big front porch. It was where Robert and Hattie would raise their their two children. And as the family grew, so did the house. Over the years, the columns and the porch were removed. The front was bricked and a garage and a breezeway were added to one side. On the rear side, he added a full two-story addition that had a kitchen, a family room, and another bedroom. As Robert Sr. and Hattie aged, Their children grew up, and in time, he retired from the tobacco business so he could spend more time with his family. And by then, they had become Nana and Paw Paw. He took his role as Paw Paw to heart, and he had just enjoyed playing with his grandchildren, teasing them, pranking them. Yeah. Nana, at five foot two inches, was a small woman with a big personality. She would tell the grandchildren Bible stories and always had an encouraging word for them or anybody else, really, for that matter. That's sweet. It is. She was one of the grandmotherly types, sweet and cheerful, not a nag, not critical. Basically, I guess the opposite of Dolores, maybe. That's what I was thinking. (laughs) Paul Ball had done well for himself in the tobacco business. And by the time of his death, at at the age of 82, his family was left well cared for financially Mm -hmm. as well. Nana continued to live at the home place. But by then, what had been a country setting had been swallowed up by the suburbs. Okay. Their son, Robert Jr., known as, now he's been known as Bob. Okay. He Su- met. And this is Susie's dad. It is Susie's dad. Okay. He met and married a lady by the name of Florence Sharp. Okay. As a young man, he had joined the Merchant Marines, and toward the end of World War II, he had gone to Haynes High School for some recruiting work. Mm-hmm. And that's where he met Florence. She was a business teacher at the school, and Florence had come from a very highly prominent family in Reedsville, North Carolina, which was only about an hour from Winston-Salem. So I'm going to give you Susie's parents' background. So this is her mother Florence's background. Okay. Florence was the daughter of James and Annie Sharp. James had started Sharp's Institute, a boarding school in Reedsville, and Annie was a teacher. The school was destroyed by fire, and James took on other employment as an insurance salesman. But he soon went bankrupt when that just didn't pan out for him. Then he took some classes for a short while at Wake Forest College, including a law school review course. Mm. At that time in North Carolina, they didn't have a requirement of formal schooling to take the bar exam. Yeah. So he took it and he passed it. Oh, wow. And was Smart able to. fellow then. Yeah. He was able to open his own law practice, even though he didn't go to law school. Gosh, that's awesome. I know. Later, his great oratory skills and likable personality led him to a successful career and a seat in the Senate. Oh, wow. Yeah, in 1925 and 1927. You can tell this family is definitely a prominent family. James and Annie had 10 children. There was firstborn Susie, 
Mm-hmm. No, that's not the Susie that's in this story. It's her aunt that she was named after. Okay. And I will come back to that later, but I just didn't want to confuse you. Okay. Then James, Sally, Annie, Thomas, Louise, Florence, the one that was married to Robert Newsom. Yes. James, John, and James Vance. Yeah, I, I just said the name James three times. Okay. <laughs> Because along with the joyous birth came great tragedy and loss, Aww. and they did end up losing three of their children. Their firstborn son, James, nicknamed Man Boy, Aww. he was only six years old when he died from a brain tumor. That is terrible. It is terrible. He was nicknamed Man Boy for his, like, stocky build. Oh. And, of course, his mother, Annie, she was devastated by the loss of her oh, boy. Sure. And so she was so, just so distraught, she wouldn't even leave his grave site as they were shoveling the dirt on his little coffin. She just couldn't do it. And finally, her husband, James, urged her. He's like, we have to go. We've done all we can do for the dead. And now we've got to look after the living. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's terrible. It is. Doesn't it just break your heart? Later, Annie gave birth to a set of twins. She named one John and the other James. And that James was named after his older brother who had passed away. James and John were the eighth and ninth children in the family. They had been accustomed to drinking fresh milk from the family's Jersey cow. But when the twins were close to two years old, they switched to getting their milk from like a dairy. And they got really sick from some tainted milk from the dairy. The twins and their older sister, four-year-old Florence, were deathly sick. Florence eventually recovered, but sadly, the twins did not. Oh, my god! They both succumbed to the illness within two weeks of each other. That is horrible. I know. And so now Annie's having to bury two more children. The great losses that Annie Britt had suffered, just they changed her. I mean, yeah, how I'm could sure. they not? Yeah. She just couldn't get out from underneath the, this grief. Mm-hmm. Um, she would sit for hours at a time just staring into space, wringing her hands, she was like almost catatonic yeah. at times, and nothing anybody in the family could do would pull her out of it. And finally, one day, their hired cook, Matilda, reprimanded her for it. She told her, Miss Sharp, it's not right for you to sit here and grieve like this. And if you don't stop it, the Lord's going to punish you for it. Oh, okay. he's going to take another one of your children. Lordy. Can you imagine? And she kept her on. <laughs> I can't even imagine. She, but it seemed to snap her out of it. Wow. She just began trying to be with her family again. And a year later, she gave birth to her last child, number 10. Oh, that gave me chills. Yeah. And she named him James Vance. So this was her third James. I think I'd quit naming him James. I don't know. I'm not superstitious, but Lord. Well, her mother-in-law agreed with you. Her mother-in-law warned her. She's like, you are not meant to have a child with that name. And that by defying the Lord, it was going to bring his wrath upon her. Whoa. Can you believe some of the things people have said to like this grieving mother? But Annie was determined she was going to have a son named after his father. And thankfully, this James was born healthy and strong. Oh. But I can't imagine... Like my mother-in-law saying that to me. Yeah, I know. How, <laughs> I don't know that I would handle that very well. No. Annie and her mother-in-law did seem to have a bit of a strained relationship, as some do. Yes. And her mother-in-law was a staunch primitive Baptist. Okay. We've talked about that before. And Annie was a Methodist. And so that caused like some headbutton between them because yeah. their, that mother-in-law was determined that they needed to be not in that Methodist church, but right. in the primitive Baptist I can only imagine that comment that she made to her about the Lord bringing wrath on her for naming her son James. I mean, that was just over the top. Yeah. Very unwarranted. It was. Well, the Sharps' remaining living children were all high achievers. From an early age, the virtues of honesty, family pride, and hard work were instilled in them. Their oldest daughter, Susie, was your typical firstborn, Mm -hmm. sometimes acting as a surrogate mother to the younger ones, especially when her mother was grieving. Yeah, sure. And always challenging herself in various ways. Pretty soon, she was being told, well, you should just be a lawyer like your daddy. And eventually, she just decided to go with it. Okay. So she graduated as salutatorian of her class. Three others of the Sharps children would go on to be salutatorians of their class as well. 
And like her father before her, she studied for the bar exam and passed it before she ever even finished her college degree. That's crazy. Yeah. They're smart. I mean, that's something. And then adding to that whole prominent family thing, this Susie Sharp would go on to become the first female appointed Superior Court judge in North Carolina. Wow. Wow. Another of the daughters, Annie, named after her mother, she studied to be a nurse at Duke University. And while there, she met a charming and good-looking man by the name of Frederick Klenner. And I'm going to let you talk about him in just a little while, yep. so I'm going to move on. But we will, we're will we going to circle back to Fred. Another daughter, Louise, became a nurse and a lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy. Wow. Their eldest son, Tommy, became a chemical engineer employed by defense contractors. And their youngest, their third James, he became a Navy surgeon. Mm. So, again, all of them just I went on to very high things. And then it was their youngest daughter, Florence, who had married Robert Newsom Jr. And she became a teacher. So they said, you know, like she was just the least of the academics. Not that right. she was not smart, but that she just, she would rather have fun. Yeah. Florence was like the youngest daughter. She was doted on. She was also the one who had also had that tainted milk oh. and almost died when she was four. Okay. She had had to learn to walk again after that. And so academics just was not in her top things to do. Yeah. She wanted to enjoy life. Yeah. And so she she did study to be a teacher, though, and that's what she was doing when she met Robert Newsom. Okay. And this was Susie's mother. Yes, and that's what I'm getting ready to tell you about now. Okay. Bob and Florence married, and they had their first child, Susie, mm -hmm. and she was born on Christmas Eve in 1947. And then her little brother, Robert Newsom III, was born three years later. We have Robert Sr., yes. who goes by Robert. We have Robert Jr. that goes by Bob. And then we have Robert III, who now goes by Rob. Okay. <laughs> so I know that gets a little confusing. <laughs> well, it was Florence's brother-in-law, Dr. Fred Klenner, we talked about, and that you're going to tell us a little bit more about. He's the one that delivered Susie. And Susie was named after her mother's eldest sister, the judge, Susie Sharp. Mm -hmm. And little Susie was dubbed Susie Q. And then she, in turn, dubbed her Aunt Susie, Susu. Okay. And that just kind of stuck within the family. So she was pretty close with her aunt. She was. Okay. And so now we have the older one that goes by Susu. The younger one is Susie Q. Did uh, Susu, did she have children of her own? She did not. She never married, never had children. Okay. So that probably made her... Right, more available because she's got this child named after her yes. you know, it's her namesake yeah well Susie's birth became with new parent worries sure. right away and while she was in the hospital nursery this unstable young woman who had gone AWOL from the women's army corps wandered into the hospital nursery while the babies were temporarily unattended picked up baby Susie and took off with her what? Thankfully, somebody noticed, and she was apprehended before she actually got out the door of the hospital. But after that, you better believe Bob did not leave his baby's side until they left that place. And in addition to that scare, baby Susie Q was diagnosed with a heart murmur by her uncle, Dr. Klenner, and he advised the new parents to not let her cry because it might trigger a heart, an irregular heartbeat or a cardiac event. Okay. So for the first year of her life, her parents frantically attempted to keep her from crying in any way possible. Probably, Probably giving her everything she wants. I was going to say, you can see where this is heading, right? <laughs> I will say they tried to be strict with her, but at, the, at this point, you know, they got this new baby. They are probably are just trying to sure anything. But I'm sure that start in life is what gave her over to maybe her tantrums later on. Right. She was a determined child. All kids, obviously, have tantrums at times, but Susie's became so bad and violent that at times Florence resorted to putting her in a cold shower to snap her out of it. Hmm. She'd go to prison today. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. And one time one of the housekeepers almost quit over it because she said, I can't do anything with that child. Really? And so her mama had a good talk with her and it kind of straightened her up a little bit. I mean, not totally, but yeah, she gauged it back somewhat. When her mama did that in the cold showers, Susie never forgot that. That was just one act that she would hold against her mother for years to come. Oh, gosh. She was a daddy's girl, but her relationship with her mother was fraught with tension and manipulation. 
So when younger brother Rob came along, Susie felt a little bit jealousy, but that's not uncommon right. along, among younger siblings. And Susie was hard on Rob. She bullied him at times. And I don't mean like physically bullied him. Like she wasn't like that, but she bossed him around. He he was very quiet and mild and gentle child. Okay. And he just didn't fight back. And so she exerted that control over him. Okay. Kept that him in sense. his place. Yeah. Sounds like so are my kids. <laughs> Growing up in an affluent family, it suited Susie Q. She took to it, and she was chosen Queen of the May in kindergarten. Okay. As she went through her teen years, she discovered a keen interest in the British royal family, and she felt her own family was special. And some of her peers would say that she thought she herself was a princess. Okay. And I'm sure her haughtiness kind of gave that impression. Right. And you you had said she was described as a snob. Right. Yeah, because Dolores calling somebody else a snob, you know it's got to be serious. Right. Susie was a beautiful young woman, but she didn't outgrow her quick temper or her ability to hold a grudge. Mm -hmm. So she graduated high school, and after one year in Queens College in Charlotte, she transferred to Wake Forest College in 1966. And the next year is when that school would change its name to Wake Forest University. Okay. And it was there in the library that she met a quiet freshman by the name of Tommy Lynch. Mm -hmm. And you've introduced us to his family. In 1970, Susie's father, Bob, he took a job with Lore Lord Tobacco Company in Greensboro. And you may not remember this, but that's where my daddy worked. Really? Yeah, all my life. I was raised on tobacco money. Okay. (laughs) Yep. Bob rose in rank there, and he eventually became the vice president. Wow. Yeah, and he took charge of the daily operations at that Greensboro plant there. Bob was very active in his community, serving in different capacities for organizations such as Boy Scouts, United Way, Goodwill. He was just, you know, a very, he was a servant leader in his community. Yeah. But as Bob got older, he wanted a slower pace of life, and um, so he left his job. He didn't quite retire. He started his own consulting business. But oh, wow. That was definitely a step down from the pace of, you know, running big, these big companies. Sure. He was known to be soft-spoken, easygoing, and a real gentleman by anybody's account. His wife, Florence, was the more outspoken of the two. And she was kind of quick to share her mind, but not in an ugly way. Yeah. When Bob's father, Robert Sr., had passed away, everyone had been worried that Nana, living by herself in their big old house, was too much. Yeah. But Nana was insistent it was not too much for her to handle, and she had no plans to downsize. And just much like Dolores, she stayed there tending to her own house. Okay. She didn't she didn't have to worry about that. She was gonna stay busy. And she did pretty well with it. Nana also stayed active with her church, making chicken pies for their monthly sale. Oh. She continued making and trimming the beeswax candles for the Moravian Service League that they sold at Old Salem. That is so cool. Isn't it? Now, wasn't her husband Moravian? Or Um, was she? She was Moravian. Okay. He was Presbyterian. Okay. You know, Old Salem is a big deal around here. Have you ever bought their beeswax candles? Yeah. You know, Amanda, she made them. Her parents or... They did that same job that Nana did? They're somehow affiliated, and I don't want to say it wrong, but I think they are Moravian. That's cool. Yeah. All right. So I went there one time and they let us make those candles. Really? At at Old Salem, which was so so cool. cool. And so um, that's neat that Amanda's parents. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Like her dad plays in that band over there. She has friends buried on in In God's God's Acre. Acre. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so neat. Um, Well, that's what Nana. Nana was very involved with the Moravian Church. Wow. And Nana was beloved in her community. She was known as Ms. Hattie. Oh. And they loved her so much. They actually hosted a Hattie Newsom Day to pay tribute to her. That is precious. Isn't it? But by the early 80s, Nana, she's now getting on up in age and concerns growing. Like, they don't know that she's really taking care of herself really well. She had been having some heart problems. And Bob and Florence had started spending some weekends over there with her to kind of help look out for her. Yeah. And by the end of 1984, Bob and Florence realized, you know, we're going to have to stay with her full time. Somebody okay. needs to be here. So they decide they're going to move in with her. And then their son, Rob, and his wife, Alice, and their three children had been living with them in their home. Mm-hmm. So they decide they're going to give Rob and Alice and the kids their house, and they're going to move into Nana's house to take care of Aww, her. Oh, that's so sweet. It so really she must is. have loved her mother-in-law. Yeah, she did. And this would have been Susie's grandma. 
Yes. Whose okay. parents are moving in with her, her grandmother. Grandma. Okay. And her brother, Rob, is staying in the house that okay. their, her parents are leaving. I love that. And Nana, she was happy to have Bob and Florence move in. And so she suggested, well, just remodel it and make it your own. Oh. And so they did. They, yeah. they started these renovations at Thanksgiving in 1984. And as always happens with a big renovation, it goes on way longer than you expect, you know, and it had. It was kind of getting to the point where Nana was just done. But they were redoing the whole back wing, had a new kitchen, dining room, bathroom, guest room upstairs. They were going to enclose the back porch and create a sunroom. They had stuff everywhere. Dust is everywhere. Workers coming in and out. And Nana's just like... (laughs) Please <laughs> finish it this. Be done. <laughs> Finished it already. So at last, in May 1985, the work was almost complete, and they were getting ready to move completely in. On Sunday, May 19th, 1985, Rob and Alice, they were expecting his parents, Bob and Florence, to come back home, because remember, yeah. they're still living in their house. Yes. They had been over that weekend moving some things into Nana's house, and they were supposed to get uh, Rob's daughter, Paige who was also in Winston-Salem with her other grandparents for a wedding. Okay. They were going to meet and pick her up and bring her home with them. Well, at 5 o'clock that evening, Alice's mom calls and is like, why haven't Bob and Florence picked up Paige? Mm-hmm. She's like, well, I'm not I'm not really sure. That's, yeah. little, you know, it was a little weird, but they said maybe they went somewhere and they are not back yet. So they call Nana's house and they don't get an answer. So eventually, Rob decides to drive to his dad, Bob's office in Greensboro, but nobody's there. So he comes back home. Alice goes to meet her parents to pick up Paige and get her home. They're still calling Nana's, and they haven't heard from Bob and Florence or Nana. By 10 o'clock that night, Rob says, I'm going to drive over there and just see what's up. But Alice says, well, just call their neighbors, the Suttons, and see if they'll go over and check. Well, Homer Sutton, they lived down the road a little bit, but he had been the Newsome family doctor for their whole lives. And so he's like, sure, me and my wife will drive over. We'll check on Bob and Florence and Nana. He and Katie pull up around 1020 at the house. Bob's car is in the driveway, as well as both of Nana's cars. Doc Sutton thought perhaps they had been out and had just gotten back home. He headed for the back door. But as they stepped onto the stone patio, he noticed the storm door glass was broken with shards of glass all over the steps. Now, even though there was renovations going on, it just wasn't like Nana to leave broken glass not picked up. Right. So that was his first inkling that seems things were a little bit weird. So he peeked through the living room window and because he could hear the TV on and he could see a lamp burning and he caught a glimpse of Nana and she was laying on the couch in her nightgown. She appeared to be asleep. And then he saw Florence laying on the floor and she was on her side and her shoes were off. And he thought, well, she may be there watching TV, but somehow he just knew that she wouldn't be as undignified as all that. And then he noticed blood on the floor. Mm. He knew something bad had happened and he knocked at the window and nobody responded. And he's wondering, well, where's Bob? He couldn't see him. Had he gone berserk and killed his mother and wife? That didn't seem likely. Was he dead, too? He just didn't know. And then he realized, could a murderer still be in here? And so he went and told his wife, and she's like, look, let's get out of here. So they quickly left, and they went next door to the Brownlee house and immediately asked uh, Pham Brownlee to call the ambulance and the police. The Brownlees, they didn't know yet what Dr. Sutton had found. He just said, call for help. And while they were waiting, Dr. Sutton's wife, Katie, called her son, Steve, and said, hey, can you call Rob Newsom and tell him that something's going on at his grandma's house? Okay. As soon as Rob and Alice got that phone call from Steve, I mean, like, they all of us, they were alarmed, obviously. Sure. There had been some trouble in the family, and they all of a sudden were, like, in fear for their own lives. They immediately turned on every light inside and outside of their home in Greensboro. Because remember, they're living in Bob and Florence's house. Yes. They double-checked all their windows, their door locks, and they start calling friends and people to come over. Like, they just want a house full of people. They do not want to be there by themselves. Rob loaded his shotgun. He was waiting to find out what's going on. So he didn't realize that his parents were dead yet? No. No, not yet. They had not told him. They just said something's happened. Okay. While the Brownleys and the Suttons waited for help to arrive at the house, they called Nana's pastor, Reverend John Geisler. He arrived before the emergency help did. 
Dr. Sutton, one of the Brownleys, and the pastor. Those three men, they go back over to the Newsom house. They figured Bob's got to be in there too. So they looked in the windows. They still couldn't see him, but Fayon Brownlee couldn't believe it's been 30 minutes and nobody has shown up. No ambulance, mm-hmm. no cop, nothing. So he shouted to his wife, Mary, go call them again and tell them to get here ASAP. Yeah. So when help finally arrived, it was just one patrol car in from Winston-Salem. And he didn't even come with his lights or siren on. As the four men were preparing to enter the house, those three plus the officer, all of a sudden the police presence showed up. Four other cars arrived in answer to that second call that she had made. Mm. Officers now realize, oh, something major is going on. They emerged with weapons drawn. And just as they did, the first officer came back out of the house, reholstering his gun. And he says, there's a man on the floor right inside the door. He's dead, too. Wow. Now that there's a heavy police presence in the neighborhood, Mary Brownlee's phone starts ringing off the hook. Neighbors are wanting to know what's going on, what happened over there. But she hadn't heard from one neighbor yet, the one that lived directly across the street from the new Newsoms. Maya Angelo. Wow, really? Yes. Professor at Wake Forest University, internationally known singer, dancer, actress, civil rights leader, and of course, poet and author. How did I not know that? that she, I never even knew that she lived in Winston. Yep. Yeah. Mary called and left her a message on the machine. And Maya, she hadn't heard about all the commotion yet. She didn't know anything was going on. But when she finally was able to call Mary back and Mary told her what was going on, she asked her, like, in disbelief, Mary, did you just tell me that Hattie Newsom was murdered? Mm. So that was just like a little interesting kind of tidbit there. Fam Brownlee was more agitated as more officers arrived because not only had they taken forever to arrive, but the crime scene was kind of chaotic. And he's thinking, like, some of these officers are just coming out of curiosity. They're Mm -hmm. traipsing through this crime scene. He thinks he sees them moving stuff. They shouldn't be moving. He's he's getting pretty ticked about this. Yeah. He's not wrong because they were there for almost 30 minutes before they realized this wasn't even their crime scene to work. Oh, my goodness. The, The house was actually outside of city limits, and they didn't realize it. And so at that point, they called the Forsyth County Sheriff's Department. When those deputies arrived, they went around to the back of the house. They saw the broken door glass. They entered the house, and just inside the hallway, they found Bob Newsom on the floor in a fetal-like position. He had been shot three times in the abdomen, once in the right forearm and once in the head. One of the shots in the abdomen had traveled straight to his heart, killing him instantly. He was just at the arched entrance to the living room, and it looked like he had been trying to flee when he was killed. Mm. The contents of Florence's pocketbook had been emptied out on the floor beside him, and just six inches from his feet, there was a hole about 30 inches in diameter that had been burned into the carpet and scorched the floorboards underneath. Huh. Yeah, that was weird. Do they know what? Well, that's to come. Okay. In the living room, there was furniture overturned, looking like there had been a struggle. Florence's body was sprawled on the floor in front of the TV and beside a puddle of dried blood. It was not noticed until later, but her throat had been cut. Oh, my gosh. She had two stab wounds in the side of her neck. Oh, my gosh. Another in her shoulder. This is Susie's mother. Susie's mother, Florence, yes. Three more deeper stab wounds in her back. One of those had severed her aorta. She also had sustained a gunshot in the right side of her chest and one in her left temple. Doesn't that seem like overkill? Doesn't it? That's obvious overkill, actually. Okay. Not like you don't think robberies end up like that. Her wedding band was bent and her finger cut underneath it as if somebody had tried to remove it, but hadn't been able to. But her Mm -hmm. engagement ring that held a three quarter uh, carat diamond was missing. Nana had been shot three times. Mm -hmm. One shot had only grazed the left side of her head. One had hit her in the lower right side. And the third had entered her right temple and exited, lodging in her shoulder. She was on the sofa with her hands clasped under her chin, leading investigators to believe she had been praying when she was shot. Oh. Well, later evidence would show that she had been positioned that way after she had been killed. Wow. On the wall above her head were two bullet holes in the plaster, and just below them was a needle point with the scripture from Joshua, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Mm. 
The rest of the house had been rifled through as if a robbery had gone bad, much like the scene at Dolores Lynch's house. Yeah, okay, so now this married couple, his mother and sister have been murdered. Have been murdered. His ex-wife's parents and grandmother, all within, so oh, within okay. less than a year. And much like at Dolores's house, there were some things missing, but then there was a lot of valuables still left behind. There was some like $400 cash sitting right there in, in the living room. Were Susie's dad or grandmother, were they only shot? Yes. Okay. Um, Florence is the one who had this, her throat cut and the stabbings, but the other two did not. There was some jewelry that was like upstairs. Some drawers had been rifled through, but jewelry had been left behind. Expensive, valuable jewelry. Some important papers had been left behind. There was a tax refund check still sitting up there. Uh, okay. So they're thinking, um, this is maybe trying to look like a robbery, but we're not buying that. Right. And upon closer inspection, it did seem that these killings had been executions. Okay. Wow. It wasn't long before Rob arrived at his grandparents' home from Greensboro. Officers sat down to talk with him, told him what had happened, and asked him some basic questions about just you know their names and their ages, that kind of thing. Rob told him how his parents had been spending weekends with his grandmother in anticipation of moving in with her after those renovations were complete and that he was going to be living in their old home. When they asked him why anyone would want to kill his parents and grandmother, he had no idea. Yeah. But when prodded further, he said, well, last summer, my sister's former mother-in-law and sister-in-law were murdered in Kentucky. Okay. And that's where we will conclude today's episode. However, listeners, if you think that's the end of the story, it is far from it. Yeah. There is so much more craziness to come. So you do not want to miss next week's episode. Yeah, you definitely do not want to miss it. Those were some hard times. They sure were. Don't go through life bitter and angry. Just remember, you'll get to hear the rest of this story next week. Till next time, goodbye.